Hello, welcome to The Market Carver. I'm Adam Harder, Chief Investment Officer of Financial Enhancement Group, as well as Andrew Thrasher, Chartered Market Technician and Portfolio Manager. We get Andrew back this week uh, after a one week hiatus and I uh, was, was happy to see Joe step in and, and fill your shoes there. Uh, I hadn't seen him on in here for a while. It was uh, uh, good to spend some time with him, at least virtually on this Market Carver. Oh, good, good. Well, it's, it's good to be back uh, and I appreciate Joe filling in for me. Yeah, so th this week we've got a few variety of topics. We're going to do some things in the uh, economic sphere, looking at initial jobless claims, uh, gold, and then uh, different types of the S&P 500, the big uh, mega weights versus the equal weights. And then lastly, take a look at equity allocations and how investors have been adjusting through this volatility. But first, we're going to talk about initial jobless claims. Uh, and the setup there is that we don't always look at all of the labor market data. Uh, certainly the one that gets most of the attention is every is the first Friday of every month. Uh, that is the non-farm payroll that it shows you how many jobs were added to the, the payroll. Uh, that's good information, but it is largely at least at, at best a coincident indicator. It means it's a, a real picture of what's going on right now. A better leading indicator is initial jobless claims because that's like the first part of an of economic cycle. Uh, as initial jobless claims. And these are claims for unemployment insurance. All right. So there's really no uh, monkeying that can go on with that business. People, when they need uh, the unemployment insurance, they're there to uh, file for that claim. And so that's really the first part of the cycle. So you can see a spike in initial jobless claims. That's an indication that there's a, some level of layoffs happening in the economy. And, and when you have that first wave, that can invite a sense of tightness in the economy. It could cause, it could be an indication of employers getting a little bit tighter. Uh, and so that spike in jobless claims then in turn uh, can produce another wave of jobless claims that you can kind of spiral into uh, the worst part of the cycle until uh, that levels off and we stop seeing an increase in jobless claims. Uh, so this is the first time that we've seen a, a significant jump. It's not a major jump. It's just significant in the fact that it's stopped falling. There's nothing too much to make of this data as of yet. It's something we would call a yellow flag rather than a red flag. Uh, many would argue that the jobless claims were just so unsustainably low. They were historically low. Uh, but nevertheless, it's uh, noticeable that it is uh, on the way up. And the main reason we want to bring it to the attention this week, and we talked about this week's investment meeting, is that the retailers, Walmart, Target, uh, some of the dollar stores and, and uh, lower discount retailers all had disastrous earnings and major drops to their stock prices. Uh, and so the concern there is that they're seeing margin pressure uh, against their earnings. And when that happens, you can tend to see uh, cuts to payrolls. And so that's just an, an early potential. Um, and those are some very significant uh, employers in the United States economy. So hopefully we don't see that. And this is just a yellow flag that we can kind of level off. Uh, but we do certainly have our eye. And that is one factor that feeds into our, our risk barometer. Uh, so we'll kind of move on here to, to gold and then we'll get into some technical analysis, which is uh, more of Andrew's bed and butter. But first, uh, gold correlation. This is a messy chart. It goes all the way back into the 1970s. So really the first thing that I'll hit here, you might have heard the term modern portfolio theory. Uh, it really was instrumental in the 1950s for bringing a mathematical uh, approach to investing. It was revolutionary in terms of looking at things that way. Uh, of course, it just becomes a problematic or it became problematic to try and set up portfolios uh, just based simply on a few assumptions. But the reason I bring that up is one of those assumptions is that the correlation between the different asset classes, whether it's stocks, uh, bonds, gold, that they're stable through time. And if you look at this chart, you can see correlations are not stable uh, through time. They are quite volatile. In the case of gold to stocks, that's gone from extremely positive to extremely negative. But this is an important function into our portfolios for construction, because if, if correlation comes down, then gold becomes more valuable as a diversifier. And just you know, one quick aside to that, a mathematical aside, this can trip some people up. Uh, correlations uh, being low does not mean that uh, one has to be going down while the other one's up. Uh, you can have two negatively or even lowly correlated assets that are up strongly. It just means that they got there at different times. Uh, and that's why a low correlation is incredibly valuable. So we do see gold coming back down. 
Uh, it does play a significant piece in our portfolios for that reason, especially as stocks and bonds became more positively correlated. Uh, gold is in there, at least in part, for this reason. I know, Andrew, at this week's uh, meeting, you brought a couple other uh, gold comments. You might just, uh, we didn't include the chart, but if you have anything you'd want to add in, in terms of why that's come back on our radar. Yeah, so every week when we look at all the different futures markets, specifically commodities, we look at what's called the commitment of traders report. It's basically a way for us to look under the hood and actually see how different trader groups are positioned within the various commodities. We can see how people are, how many are short that commodity, how many are long that commodity. And it really shows us the kind of almost a true, pure supply demand um, within different markets. And gold is no exception. And we're starting to see a little bit more interest in gold from the people that actually use it in their business. So people who are actually using gold within their, um, their under, well, they're using it for jewelry, they're using it for electronics, um, whatever, all the different uses that are for gold. By all means, not my area of expertise, but what we can see is they're starting to get a little less bearish on gold prices. And we're seeing it actually across a lot of other different precious metals and, and industrial metals as well. And so that's an area of focus that we've, we've started looking at, um, as well as some other, other commodities. Um, and so we're always interested to see how are the different players in different markets, how are they positioned? And right now, gold looks a little attractive. Um, part with that, that negative correlation Adam was talking about is always a, a, is beneficial to be able to have some diversification in the portfolio, um, having a little bit of things that maybe go down or go up when the market goes down uh, definitely doesn't hurt in a year like we're having so far. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'll flip our attention now to two stocks and specifically these groups. And uh, I just it's hard to overemphasize how important this chart is and the different ways that you can construct baskets of stock. So, uh, Andrew, if you'd walk us through what we're looking at here um, between these three different measures, it would be great. Yeah, so the chart's pretty simple. On the top, we have the S&P 500, your standard large cap index. The bottom part of that chart, it says equal weight S&P 500. Um, we have to remember that the S&P 500 itself is cap weighted. So it's it's each stock within that index, uh, its weighting is determined by how large it is. So the largest stock, think Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, Google, Berkshire Hathaway, they have the largest share of the S&P 500. Other way we can look at it is just everyone gets an equal weighting. And so that's what the equal weight S&P, the smallest company has the same um, say, so to speak, as Apple does. And then the middle we have with the FAAMG, we call that FANG, or used to be FANG. And those are the large, some of the largest stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Google. And we look at just those stocks because they're some of the largest ones in the market for a long time. That were the, the main drivers um, last year, something we talked a lot about in allocation meeting. They were the drivers for the market going higher. We weren't seeing a lot of participation from a lot of the other stocks. It was just these handful of mega caps that were moving the market higher. That was part of the reason we started to get a little concerned toward the end of last year. Um, now we see kind of the flip side where it's actually those big mega cap stocks are what's driving the market lower. As we can see on this chart, if you look closely, you'll see there's that red line on the the, the fang, the middle portion of that chart, where they're making a lower low. Um, and the, the bottom part was not. And so what we can see is that the mega caps were actually weaker than the average stock within the S&P 500. And that's what was driving the market lower. And so it's very hard when you have these very volatile days where you have an Apple maybe down three or 4%. Tesla was down 8% one day. It's hard for the market to digest those mega cap stocks when they have these big volatile down days, regardless of what everyone else is doing in the market. And so we see where the market gets driven lower by those mega caps. And they really can swing the market around quite a bit. Um, just the largest four account for 18% of the entire S&P 500. So when uh, when they start to sing, everyone starts to listen. And it's it's definitely an important part of the market we want to pay attention to. Yeah, and just to, as a, a point of clarification, I had this question actually from a, a regular Market Carver viewer. And so I think it's it's, it's time to take a pause and just uh, share with you. Some of you have been listening forever and we truly appreciate that. Some of you are new. When you see charts like this that are clearly significant and in indicating uh, a change in leadership, if it is deemed significant and, and we're sharing you with these adjustments, you can rest assured that your allocation team has been at work. And we have made adjustments in your portfolio. So we never expect you to watch and to take that information and to you know, ask if you need fewer of the fame stocks or, or more of an equal weight approach. That is something that we're doing on your behalf. Now, oftentimes, like the initial jobless claims, it may be something we have our eye on and we just want to share you with our thinking. Uh, others 
uh, like this Feng versus equal weight is a good uh, explanation for why we've made some of the changes that we have, which has certainly been uh, a tilt away from those large cap growth stocks. Um, and that began last year, but it's just a continuation of that. So just wanted to make that clear and, and sticking with adjustments to equity allocations, just uh, kind of as a, as a preview to this, uh, just from having gone through a, a few of these cycles through time, going back over a couple of decades, this one to me just has all the feels of quite orderly um, and a, a very large decline without a huge sense of, of panic. So uh, this, you're just kind of generally observing that. And, and that's, uh, I guess, seems to jive with what you're showing in this chart here in terms of adjustments to equity allocations. Yeah, this was pretty interesting. This came from Bank of America. And so they they looked at all their private client um, accounts and they looked to see what percent of their accounts were still invested in equities. And even though the markets come down 20 percent, some stocks significantly more than that, um, we really haven't seen a, a big move off of those highs. So kind of at the, at the peak of the market, the uh, the average client account at Bank of America held 66 percent of their portfolio in equities. And that's now come down to just 63%. So we really didn't see a large decline, um, a lot of settling within those, those accounts. Compare that to after the COVID crash in 2020, 2020 we dropped down to 54%. And we go all the way back to the, to the depths in, in 2009. You can see here it got down to 39%. So you saw much heavier selling, much more what we call in the market capitulation, where people just kind of threw up their hands, they get me out. And those are the types of things where everyone just kind of rushes for the exits. Those are the signs we look for for when actually the market bottoms. So I get asked all the time, when is the where are we going to have the low? When should we start buying? When is the bottom going to hit? Um, that's the constant question I get from journalists. I did two interviews last week from different networks asking when when's the bottom going to come. And part of the one of the indicators we look for is when everyone is finally sold. And what we're seeing from Bank of America's data is there's been very little selling from their private private investor group. There hasn't been a lot of panic that's entered this market. Um, the market was so in tune, so many traders were in tune with just buy the dip, buy the dip, the market will always recover, that now that we're starting to see some real selling take place, they're apprehensive to sell, assuming it will come back. And so that means maybe there has to be lower levels in the market, not saying that's what's going to happen, but maybe that's what's going to have to force them to finally capitulate. And that would be one of the, the positive signs, actually, we would see saying, okay, finally, everyone's sold. Once everyone's sold, then it's a great time to start looking for some buying opportunities. But it's interesting to see here that on at least from their slice of the market, their, their client base really hasn't seen much de decrease in their equity allocation. And so this tells us that there's still maybe some uh, some assets that haven't hit the market quite yet that haven't been scared out of their equity allocations. Um, but also maybe it's a, it's a positive as well that they're sticking to um, maybe long term growth principles, things that we often discuss with our own clients, that we need to look at our long term plan, look at the full journey, not just the snapshot. Um, and maybe that's a good thing that they're not being panicked. They're not having emotions take over. So we kind of look at it as a positive and a negative uh, from either our advisor hat or from our trader hat, depending on what we want to wear. Um, but right now from Bank of America, they're not seeing a lot of fearful selling take place within their client accounts at this point. All right. Well, thank you, sir. It's certainly good to have you you're back with us. And appreciate all of you uh, watching. We remind you every week that uh, you can give us a call to set up an appointment if something jogged your attention here or, or need to get in and see us. By all means, give us a call or scan the QR code 800-928-4001 is the number. Uh, and as always, we've got our weekly radio show that we are kicking back up uh, with additional content. So look forward to that. Consider this on WIBC uh, each week as well as other stations around the state or however is most convenient for you. Uh, via where you get your podcast. So thanks again. Everyone have a great weekend.